Hi, my name is Wendy Harmon. I work at the American Red Cross as the Des reset. <laughs> I'll get on a roll, I promise. Hi, my name is Wendy Harmon and I'm the Director of Social Strategy at the American Red Cross. Thanks so much for having me here today uh, for this conference. I myself am just older than a millennial by a hair, uh, but I frequently identify with many of the characteristics that are assigned to the millennial generation. And uh, I've been working at the American Red Cross for almost six years since late 2006. So we were pretty early to the, to the social web in trying to create strategies and really inspiring people to take action on behalf of the Red Cross. So I'm going to share a handful of stories today uh, with you and hopefully they'll be useful in all of your endeavors. We uh, First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about our team at the American Red Cross, uh, just so you have an idea of what our structure looks like. I am the Director of Social Strategy, as I mentioned. I have a, we have a team of three people, including me, and uh, Christiana Almeida is in charge of being our field liaison. She's part cheerleader, part therapist, part several other different things in making sure that we're all, uh, the cacophony becomes a symphony uh, when it when we're talking about all of our field units across the country. We have 600 chapters, 36 blood regions, many uh, SAF uh, service armed forces stations as well. So Gloria Wong is in charge of the Disaster Online Newsroom. She's really architected much of how we use our digital operations center and uh, creates our content on a daily basis as well. Uh, as a whole, we're in charge of devising and implementing a social strategy from the national level. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Uh, we have nearly 300 now active chapters, field units across the country, uh, and by active we mean on the on the social web using social media tools. Uh, and I should mention that today I'm, I'm going to be concentrating quite a bit on social media as it pertains to leveraging uh, peer influence because that's my area of expertise. So just a quick note as well about the Red Cross. You can see here we have a lot going on every single day that I mean, much of it you might not exactly know about. Uh, we respond to about 200 home fires every single day across the country. We uh, connect deployed military service members with their families about 475 times a day. Uh, you can read this slide, it goes, it goes on and on, but they're pretty remarkable statistics. And it's our job to sort of translate all of that activity into inspiring action and to really begin to let go as an organization. And that's really what this topic is all about, right? We're a, we're a stuffy 130-year-old organization and, and we're really going through an adaptation process where we have to begin to tear down some of our institutional walls and really collaborate much more with the public and with this millennial generation in, in allowing them to have some control over uh, our messaging and, and even participating in how we execute our mission. So let's get down into the meat of, of things. This is a quote from our one of our board members, actually, in the Board of Governors. Her name is Young Mi Moon. She has said that social media is not a top-down marketing tool. It's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. And we've really embraced this quote as as a as a philosophy in a way of, of how we will present ourselves on the web and how we will uh, allow and, and hopefully inspire legions of young people to become part of the mission of the Red Cross. So we have th three main points to our social engagement philosophy. One is that we want to empower social communities to execute our mission. And this is probably the, the most important part, and I'll go into this a bit with some, some specific examples very soon. But 
what we're always trying to do is provide value to our community. We're, we don't think of our Facebook fans or our Twitter followers or our blog readers as an audience. We think of them as our community and we're in the mix every day as part of them. And whenever there's you know an opportunity for action, we give them the tools for them to carry that action to their own social networks. So we're not uh, ever really trying to advertise or market to them. We're we, are, we consider them family, right? And uh, we also are always in, you know, I think every nonprofit organization has this goal, whether they want to admit it or not, but we, if we're doing everything right, we should go out of business, right? So what we're trying to do is put all of the power that we possibly can into the hands of regular people who are inspired to take action. And we do that by by giving them as many concrete tactics as we can that are as frictionless as possible. Uh, the second point is we want to grow our network of passionate supporters. And we do this, I think lots of people have heard me talk about this. We have a foundation of listening. The Red Cross is mentioned about 4,000 times a day. We are in the mix of that every single day. We read all 4,000 of those mentions. We respond to lots and lots of them. And we are increasingly uh, encouraging our employees and volunteers to respond as well and to be part of this conversation and, and creating I call it a fabric you know I guess a net, network is a synonym there uh, but I think really uh, allowing everybody to be a participant instead of just one brand voice but it's uh, you know of someone standing behind the brand we're encouraging every employee and every volunteer to come around and sort of stand in front of the brand and we really are are doing that so that we can provide access points at every level of the organization for anyone who may need help, who, who may need to access some of our um, services and so on. And again, we're trying to make social engagement part of the operational DNA of the Red Cross. And I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end as well, but I truly think that in order to uh, embrace the power of the social web and these tools, we have to move from our current uh, structure, which is that my three-person team sort of triages everything that has to do with social engagement, to really encouraging every person at the Red Cross to be a participant and, again, to have that access point all along the way. And when we have that huge fabric, the Red Cross itself is made up of about 30,000 employees and hundreds of thousands of volunteers. If all of us are participating, then there's almost nothing that we can't do in, in inspiring even more people to take action. So let's head down this, this path of social fundraising. It's a hot topic, right? How do you, uh, how do you solicit peer-to-peer -peer giving? What's the, what's the um, what makes people inspired to act? So I'm going to tell you a tale of, of three different disasters. And I know many of you are advocacy organizations and you may have advocacy campaigns and that's not really the way that the Red Cross works, but many times a, a major disaster is sort of similar for us to something that your advocacy campaign might be. Uh, so let's talk about the day that the Haiti earthquake uh, hit. It happened at 4.53 p.m. and by 8 p.m. that day, we had worked with the State Department and, the, and MGIV to set up the text Haiti to 90999 uh, short code to raise $10. We uh, tweeted, you can see at 9.38 p.m., you can text Haiti to 90999 to donate $10 to Red Cross relief efforts in Haiti. And that was all we really had to do. We put a very similar message on our Facebook page. and because that was a mix of a very shareable um, action item and there was a moment when people, the American public, really wanted to show to do something because their hearts were breaking at the news coverage. By that point, it had been about three hours. And uh, we were astonished at the amount that this one tweet spread. So that one action item on Twitter and on Facebook allowed 
so many people to to be inspired to share it amongst their friends and and it gave every, all of the american public this feeling that they could make a difference with a small action and include all of their friends in in doing that as well um in haiti so i'll juxtapose that story with two uh, surrounding stories and I'll start with one that happened before and so about six months I believe before the Haiti earthquake there was a typhoon called Andoy that hit the Philippines and we didn't do this but the someone put on Twitter our the American Red Cross's 1-800 number and said you should call this 1-800 number to donate to Typhoon Andoy and that message was inspiring enough and enough people retweeted it that it was trending for many hours and uh, it happened in the night and so when I got to work I immediately called our uh, call center and I said are, are you all okay because it takes a lot to trend on Twitter right that's thousands and thousands and thousands of retweets and people talking about this and so I figured that lots and lots of calls had come through and I thought maybe the call center had been stretched and I called our uh, development office and said, you know, can you run the numbers? Are we seeing a huge increase in donations for international services or international relief? And it turned out that we didn't receive a single phone call or a single uh, donation. So a lot of people had spread that message, but it, but there was something about it that didn't inspire them to actually pick up the phone and call. And that could be because it was a telephone call and, and who you know, nobody wants to use the phone for talking anymore. Uh, maybe text was a better action item. I don't have all the answers. I'm just presenting you with this this story. Uh, but I thought that it was really inspiring when the Haiti earthquake happened. That not only had we found something that uh, people would share abundantly through their peer networks, but would also all be taking the action by texting. Uh, and then we have one other story. Uh, the Japan earth when the Japan earthquake happened, I believe it was on March 11th of 2011. So about a year and two months after the Haiti earthquake, it happened at uh, just after midnight Eastern Standard Time in the United States. And by 8 a.m. the next morning, there was so much muscle memory from the Haiti earthquake that we were trending once again to text Red Cross to 90999. That's a good, I don't know, 10 or 12 hours before anyone at the Red Cross had a meeting about whether we would raise money or not. So that muscle memory and that action that people were sort of aching to come together to do something to solve a discrete problem uh, was really quite inspiring and surprising to us. And I have this slide here that shows all of the support um, immediately. We didn't have to do a, any or much outreach at all around um, asking people to text Red Cross to 90999 or to, to donate. Celebrities, regular people, um, and, and everybody in between, companies, all grabbed onto this action item immediately without us ever having to do a thing. And so I think that's one of those lessons that when you find that good mix between the action item and shareability that, that there's all, it, nothing is impossible can see here's just an image of the tweet when that happened. Uh, we were trending by 8 a.m. and continued to trend on Twitter for about 48 hours, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I guess you are quoting me on that. Um, and we raised about $4 million over several weeks. So, and that's continued, we've continued to see that as disasters happen, that people are now know that that's the action that they can take um, to, to make a very quick difference. So uh, social fundraising is one thing, and it's really awesome uh, that, that we've been able to see so many examples, and the Red Cross is not one. I'm sure other people will share lots of these examples over the, the, day, the course of the day today. But one of the things we're really concentrating on, rather than fundraising or straight marketing and, and leveraging those, our peer networks, is as I mentioned before, we want to go out of business, right? Um, not, not really, but 
<laughs> we want to put all of the power, as much power as we can, into the hands of our stakeholders. And that this definitely includes the millennial generation because they're the ones who understand how this is going to work and they're the ones who are using these tools. So we want to really begin to execute our mission on the social web. And uh, that really hit home to us during the Haiti earthquake in the middle of those 2.3 million tweets about uh, giving. We saw tweet, several hundred tweets just like this one that were from people who were stuck in the rubble under, in, in, under supermarkets in Port-au-Prince. And we began to really understand the power of, of how social tools like Twitter, Facebook, and you know, there's lots of others could be in the moment of a crisis and how we also saw, you know, with that outpouring of support, how much we could um, connect those two groups of people together and become a liaison to, to both people who need to get help and people who need to, to give it. And if we put the right tools into everybody's hands, then they'll be able to, to execute our mission of, of saving people's lives or reset. they'll be able to execute our mission. They'll be able to provide that relief. They'll be able to help their neighbors be prepared and to respond and to, to whatever emergencies might come their way. So, and again, I've, I touched on this in the very beginning, but our, we live in this world now and these tools actually allow people to, to gather and to solve discrete problems without the benefit of big infrastructures and institutions. And for the American Red Cross, what we've had to recognize as a big institution with lots of infrastructure is that we have to begin, we, we shouldn't let go of all of that 130 years of experience in disaster response, for example. Uh, you know, we, we know what works. There's a, there's a definite science to how our service delivery gets done, but imagine if we can supplement that with uh, situational awareness and with uh, giving really the public a seat at the table of our disaster operations and allowing them to become part of the solutions. Uh, Craig Fugate, who's the head of FEMA, has often said we have to stop looking at the public as a liability and start looking at them as a resource. And we at the American Red Cross have really taken that quote on as well and and said, you know what, you're right, they're not the regular people and especially young people who are so enthusiastic about serving are not our not in our way if we can focus them the correct way and be a great leader and a great and a great liaison they can get anything in the world done so we began to start to try to walk the walk with this uh, idea of delivering services via the social web and we've piloted a digital volunteer role which now allows more people than just those of us who work here who maybe who haven't uh, had exposure to the Red Cross before or been touched by it or been a volunteer can now start to participate using some of the tools and their expertise that they're really familiar with which is social networking so we've piloted this this role to to uh, activate people from all around the country and really all around the world to take shifts in helping during disasters. We know there's lots of people who talk about the uh, affected people who talk about their situations, their emotions, their needs, their wants during a disaster on the social web. Uh, and so actually I mentioned earlier in the talk that there we, we experienced about 4,000 uh, social mentions about the Red Cross every day, that number skyrockets to hundreds of thousands during a disaster. And so we need help. We need people to help us participate in responding and connecting all of those people to the resources that they need. And uh, we've begun training these people to take shifts. And if any of you are interested in, in participating in this program, it's just uh, email social media at redcross.org and we'll begin the process of getting you trained. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. We have from the uh, spring storms last year. If you'll remember, there were several major, major tornado outbreaks last year. We've had uh, a fair number of them this spring as well. But we started to notice lots of people using the, the uh, hashtag tornado uh, and, and bathtub. And 
and really began to activate our digital volunteer network to to start to respond to these people, but not just to respond to them, but to connect them with each other. If you've got a hundred people who are all tweeting about being in a bathtub in a similar city, they probably don't know about each other. And so we spent a lot of time connecting with them with one another and saying, you know, you're not alone. And here are some, some tips for getting through this tornado in the safest possible way. And, uh, that's been some really meaningful work. And so not, not everybody can be, uh, deployed to a disaster uh, location and to serve as a Red Cross volunteer, although that door is open to everyone to to sign up and to train to do that. But on any given disaster, there's lots more you can do than actually being there physically. And we want to really open up those floodgates and, and start to allow people to to solve these issues. And, you know, a big part of the Red Cross's mission is to provide hope and comfort in people's worst moments. And, you know, there's nothing that says that all of us as a country can't do that for people who are affected using these tools. And that's one of the, the more inspiring ways that we've begun to try to leverage um, peer influence here uh, at the Red Cross. And one note, this is just another example here of how, uh, how what we're doing on online and on Twitter. I'm using Twitter examples because they're easy and they're plentiful and uh, we're still seeing a majority of uh, conversations happening on, on Twitter, that open platform. Uh, they, they could very well be happening on Facebook just as often, but we're only looking at public Facebook posts. So Facebook is more a series of closed networks. So it's a little bit harder to track and to show you after the fact. Uh, but I want to also point out that you have to begin to, to relax a little about language and the way that people talk. I think, you know, this is a good example, um, this tweet. You know, many times I think if this were to pop up, most people in a professional work setting would say, oh, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't respond to that person because, there, you know, there's a little bit of language here. They're not speaking um in a professional manner. Well, that's not how people speak on these. And, and I don't think going forward with the millennial generation, there's no difference between our, you know, professional and personal lives. It's more of a blend. And so I think that our, you know, our language is probably going to be shifting quite a bit as well. And so we were able to res respond to that person and give him a little bit of confidence. And uh, here's a, another example. Uh, many times we can you can also leverage peer influence to correct uh, uh, a little bit of misinformation. We often get people who want to give us items in a disaster scenario instead of money, and really uh, we can't we don't have the warehousing ability, the staff uh, to to sift through all that stuff to inventory it and to properly distribute it. So it's much easier for us to collect cash donations is actually much better for the local economy because then we go out and do our best to buy from the businesses that have been affected and to then distribute those items that are um, consistent with one another. So the uh, you'll see this example here. We were able to actually um, not only stop this one person from sending in lots of um, food and items and, and volunteers, but we also, also were able to get him to share this corrected notion with all of his network. And if we weren't in there uh, listening and responding every single day, we wouldn't be so nimble to be able to hop in to a conversation at any given moment. And so it takes that everyday practice so that when you know, the spotlight is on you and, it, and it's on all of us at one point or another, then you're able to be nimble and responsive and, and proactive and uh, really use that, that network that you've built uh, over time during your steady state to activate and to really uh, make sure that we go forward with this notion that we're all in this issue together, right? So... <laughs> There's, I, I'm going to call this accidental peer leveraging, and I have a couple of examples. One is a Red Cross example, one isn't, uh, of, of how this idea of being nimble is also really important. Uh, in February of 2011, yes, February of 2011, uh, my colleague accidentally tweeted to the Red Cross account, which at the time had about 250,000 followers, a tweet 
that said something like uh, Ryan found another four pack of Midas Touch when we drink we do it right hashtag getting slizzard and when that happened uh, you know it was a mistake right we hadn't intended to launch a campaign of any sort uh, we we certainly didn't intend to do that tweet or to indicate that the Red Cross uh, endorses drinking at all. So what we did though was had a great fabric in place, a network, and uh, I got a phone call. It happened, the tweet went out at, uh, at 11 something at night and I got a phone call close to midnight asking me, you know, do I know about this tweet? And so I took it down immediately and then I began to think, well, this happens a lot to companies. It's not a unique situation, but every company or congressman I've seen has sort of acted stuffy and denied it or, or said, you know, I don't know, you know, we didn't do this. And I think that if nothing else, the internet is quite the truth finder. And so I figured also that it gives you a really a window into the soul of how a company actually operates. Are they really a social organization and open and transparent or are they just sort of trying to portray that image instead of actually being that image? And uh, so what we did was leaned into it. I thought, wonder if, if we just completely admitted this, made a little joke because it really has nothing to do with our service delivery or any other mission area and uh, and, and we'll see what happens. So we published the tweet there at the top that says we've deleted the rogue tweet, but rest assured the Red Cross is sober and we've confiscated the keys. And within moments, we, there were already several thousand tweets out there in the meantime where people were like, yeah, the Red Cross is drunk and things were looking kind of bad, right? And we did that and they began to turn around immediately and truly embraced us as an organization who, who wasn't afraid to to laugh, to be a part of them as a community. Again, we're not thinking of them as this audience that we're speaking to in, in talking points all the time, but that we're a living, breathing organization and, and, and they are part of that community as well. And so what happened the next day was that uh, craft beer lovers began to, to donate because they loved how we responded to it. They loved, um, they loved this idea. They felt very included, I think. And um, restaurants all over the country and bars began to say, if you donate to the Red Cross, then you'll, you know, and you can prove it, we'll give you a free pint, at, you know, after a few hours after. And so we saw a fairly significant increase in donations and blood donations that day. And this is just a lesson in in again that letting go and um, and also being ready to embrace surprising peer uh, peer to peer relationships. We never would have targeted craft the craft beer community. It happened by accident, and and uh, but the fact that we didn't shun them or or uh, act like we didn't want to discuss this anymore is what really turned them into a, a viable segment for us, a viable group of people, a viable part of our tribe um, for the Red Cross. So it's just a, a funny, silly lesson. You know, the internet is, is a silly place most days. It can be very, very serious, but I think, you know, you have to not be afraid of losing some of that control over what you think, you, you know, the values of your organization are. We, I don't think we let go of any of the values of our organization. We simply admitted to, to a mistake and let that community um, support us on our own. So you see here, we made quite a bit of, of news in having handled that in a way that ended up inspiring lots of people to take an action. Um, there's one other example here, which is uh, Greenpeace. I hope they don't mind that I'm using them as an example, but this is a little bit different. They did intend to begin a campaign. They, I, I believe it was a, a name, a, name this whale campaign and they were trying to do some education around um, whaling efforts and so they had a series of uh, they had tried to control it by giving people options for names and they were all very regal and culturally appropriate and you know cool and 
the Reddit community actually came up with an alternative name, which was, I believe, Mr. Splashy Pants. And the internet went wild, right? Everybody voted for Mr. Splashy Pants. And at first, Greenpeace tried to shut it down and to control it and said, I believe they extended the, the length of their campaign and disregarded all of the Mr. Splashy Pants votes. But eventually, they came around and they embraced that Reddit community because more than a million of them participated. Those are probably a good portion of that million people were not actually interested in Greenpeace or whaling before. Um, and, and today, that was their chance to sort of reach out and give that group, that internet Reddit community, a big Greenpeace hug and continue. And I believe they ended up making a significant amount of money off of merchandise for Mr. Splashy Pants. And they actually educated far more people than they probably ever imagined they would. And so things don't always work out exactly as you think they will on, on the internet. There's no such thing as a controlled marketing campaign anymore. You never know what's going to happen. And, and you have to be ready for that with this generation. They want to have their say. They want to twist it in the way that they, that that makes sense to them, that is inspiring to them, that they can get their friends involved with. And so I think, you know, for the most part, and in most examples, letting that happen is one of the most rewarding things that an, an institution or a nonprofit can do. So I'm going to come back around to uh, discussing a little bit about how we have set ourselves up as an organization to make sure that we can we are nimble enough to do this letting go. And we do it with a series of documents. Uh, the first one is our online communications guidelines. I've just given you the first little snippet of it here. Uh, it's available online if you'd like to access it. it uh, I, we have it up on Scribd. If you search American Red Cross on Scribd, that, that's good. And probably if you just Google it, you'll find it. Um, but this document is meant uh, you know, one of our philosophies, as I mentioned in the beginning, is to really allow every employee of the Red Cross and every volunteer of the Red Cross to participate in the social web on behalf of it. I, I explained that idea of instead of standing behind the brand as an sp official spokesperson and only saying the things that the brand would say, we really want to encourage and allow all of our employees and volunteers to step in front of the brand, to be themselves. And the Red Cross is part of who they are, but it's not everything about who they are. And so we, this document is really meant for them to have some helpful tips and tools and to give them the confidence to really begin to participate in the web and to find that line, with the blurry line that, that those of people who are a little bit older than the millennial generation have trouble with uh, between professional and personal and, you know, mixing that up. It's, it's amazingly difficult for people who are not millennials to do this, but it is almost innate, uh, if not almost, it is innate for the millennials to, th to think this way, to not have to have a document like this, right? But in order for us to, to engage with this generation of activists, we have to begin to learn to think like them. And this document is one example of how we're doing that. Uh, here's just an example of one of our uh, Red Crosser, who has a personal blog. Uh, he happens to be a communicator, so he's maybe a little bit predisposed to blogging or, or participating in the social web. But I think he's done a good job of having a, this, it's not a disclaimer, it's just an explanation of who he is and where he works and how those things are actually very complementary. And we love that. This is a chart that I found from Allison Fine, actually. If you don't know who she is, she's a very smart, I'm sure you do know who she is, but very smart uh, teacher and speaker in our sector uh, about social media. And this chart, I think, it puts in a simple at-a-glance way to everybody that I've showed it to how we are beginning to approach um, mission delivery, communications, marketing in a whole new way. And it has to happen from, from every part of the organization, whether it's a phlebotomist at a blood drive or a, a secretary at a chapter or a um, subject matter expert scientist within our um, CPR area. So 
One of the other documents we have is a handbook, we call it, and we've just released the second version of this handbook. And what we're trying to do is give our field units, like I mentioned, we have 600 chapters, 36 blood regions, lots of offices around the country, the, the tips and tools, and really this is a checklist, and you're only seeing a, a little part of it here. I just wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like. A checklist of how, what we think a socially savvy field unit looks like and and tips and steps for for getting there and in and we're doing this and we're all in on becoming a social organization because we think that we probably won't exist through the millennial generation if we don't start to tear down some of these walls and begin to collaborate with uh, with stakeholders from every area whether they're donors clients uh, volunteers, employees, or have never been a part of the organization at all. So this also we share publicly. If you search Red Cross uh, social media handbook or social engagement handbook, you'll probably find it. Uh, you can always contact me if you'd like for me to send it to you directly. And here's an example of someone who's uh, within our service to armed forces program area is beginning to take on this role and really starting to blur that professional personal line and she's uh, spending lots of her actual work time um, responding to people and taking in their their input about her program so pretty cool to see we've talked a lot about this digital volunteer role and mission delivery and Truthfully, some of that takes a bit of training. Uh, we still haven't reached the point where we were letting go of all control. Uh, you know, we don't have to train people in how to, to um, speak to clients in a crisis situation and, you know, mental health tips and, and all this sort of thing. And so there's, there's a little bit of a hurdle to becoming a digital volunteer. And I think what we're really looking forward uh, to now is creating a more frictionless way of participation in the mission of the Red Cross. And, you know, one of those steps is definitely the, the text Red Cross to 90999 campaign because anyone can participate in that, you know. And a, a second one is in peer-to-peer uh, -peer fundraising. So, you know, we know there's lots of tools out there like Facebook Causes and CrowdRise and Razoo and the list goes on and on and on. And really encouraging people and letting them have control over how it is that they raise money for the Red Cross is uh, it, an important and, and honestly a little bit of a difficult cultural adaptation for us. So we, uh, we're working very hard to come up with this uh, a suite of tools that allows anyone who wants to participate in the mission of the Red Cross, regardless of how they got inspired to do that, to, to have this list of recommended ways and actions they can take that are super easy, that require zero training. And uh, we're, we should be rolling that out very soon. And here is just an example of one of those, which is that uh, we just developed badges. This is very simple. And allow people, instead of trying to market to them, allow them to market themselves, to label themselves, to be proud of, of being a part of the Red Cross. And so something as simple as, as these badges has been shared many, many thousands of times. Uh, and it just really lets our community shine lets them carry the mission with them to their own friends. And we could never reach that many people otherwise. So that's about all I have. And thank you so much. I uh, look forward to speaking with you in person at some point one day soon, if I haven't already. Uh, thank you so much.